All right, so let's get started. So our first speaker is John Stout from Harvard. Please go ahead, John. Great. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, what I want to talk about is you know, something that is called gravitational collider physics, um, which is based on a, a few different work. Um, here are the archive numbers. And the goal of these are to turn binary black hole in spirals into detectors of new particles. So identi to identify uh, very sharp and very strong signals that can arise when you have a very light and very weakly coupled field. Um, that exists in our universe. Um, so the way I wanted to structure this talk is to essentially isolate the main ingredients. There's a very general mechanism that gives you these very large signals. And I uh, don't think that that is a particular mechanism that is only associated to the example that we study. And so what I want to do is I want to talk about the mechanism and kind of the ingredients and then uh, illustrate that in a specific example and give uh, some parametric estimates. Um, so really the motivation, I mean, we're kind of clear like we're all here to better understand uh, the universe. And really the, the main question is, uh, if I have an extremely weakly coupled field, a particle, and it's not necessarily abundant in our universe, or cosmically abundant, it's not reheated or anything, how would we actually be able to detect such a thing? Um, and when I, when I say weakly coupled, I mean basically only gravitationally coupled. So the standard model, And this is a question that for me is motivated by um, top-down constructions coming from quantum gravity or string theory. And a lot of string compactifications and a very large ensemble of string compactifications, what you typically get is this kind of whole conglomerate or region of axions whose mass is kind of uniformly distributed in log. but they're not necessarily coupled to the standard model in a, in a very direct way. And there's no reason why they had to be produced during the evolution of the universe. And given that, you know, this is certainly uh, evidence that's found under a very specific lamppost of highly supersymmetric string compactifications, but there seems to be, you know, pretty strong, you know, theoretical pressure to thinking that Axion solves some sort of problem in quantum gravity. It's a very useful, I think, and well motivated thing to ask like, how could we actually probe this sort of structure? And the real killer is this weak coupling. Because usually, when you have a weak coupling, it's very hard to detect something. It only appears and makes macroscopic, you know, uh, macroscopically large observations when it's in some sort of condensate or is kind of coherently amplified. And the idea is instead of relying on like how dark matter provides a very large uh, effect on the universe in terms of there's just a lot of stuff, have, instead of having this kind of enhancement due to very large conglomerations of it, instead rely on resonance to resonantly amplify this weak coupling and um, so that we can actually be able to detect it. So one of the, the primary mechanisms that we're going to rely on is some periodic but slowly varying in frequency perturbation, which res can resonantly perturb the system. And that's 
provided by well, binary n spirals. Doesn't have to be a black hole, doesn't have to be you know, a particular system, but the main structure here that's at work is the fact that if I have one system, I'm going to talk about black holes. I have a black hole of mass M. I have a companion of mass M star. I'll use this notation Q to denote the mass ratio of the two and star to denote properties of the companion. These are separated by some radius R star. And as we're very familiar with this N spiral around the big black hole emitting gravitational radiation and its orbit shrinks and its frequency trips. Okay. So, I know that the frequency of this gravitational perturbation, which I'll call big omega of T, this depends on all like this. This is probably appropriate. And the, this is some reference frequency with respect to what the chirp rate is defined. So specifically, the chirp rate is given by you know, some boring numerical factor and then some thing that depends on the mass ratio, the mass of this <laughs> big black hole, and then mega not for the other parts. Okay. And so if I plot this frequency of this the perturbation that the, the companion applies to this entire region, then it's going to behave. Like this, and this is the mode we've done. Out here, the end spiral phase, so that's where we're going to pay attention to. And kind of crucially, what we're going to do is think of the frequency in that. that range of being roughly a linear ramp, okay? And so what we can say is that if there's some physics here that is able to form some system, some beyond the standard model system that has a certain structure, you know, a discrete structure, then that structure has a gravitational, gets perturbed, at a frequency that slowly increases, slowly scans the frequency. And if that new physics has discrete frequencies or discrete spectrum, then there will be points at which that frequency matches the energy difference or the frequency difference between those two states. And that perturbation can be resonantly enhanced. So I think one of the like key things is that that resonant enhancement becomes more efficient the more weakly coupled the system is. If it's strongly coupled to other degrees of freedom, then that washes out the resonance. But the fact that this is so weakly coupled means that as long as this companion is moving slowly enough, the scanning across frequencies slowly enough, that there can be very large and very sharp resonant effects. The coupling turns on at a very specific point in time. And what that can do is that can cause the system to change its structure, change its shape, and that can have very large effects on the companion and the orbital. Like, <clears throat> yeah, it seems that will be scanning many more frequencies. Yes. Phase, yeah. Phase. yeah. So uh, what I'm going to do is focus on things that I can actually calculate. And 
there's a very nice regime where I can say I know what's going on. Um, but that's certainly true. Um, so what I want to do is kind of give an illustration of this, this general mechanism. Usually what will happen here is that this will have you know, some spectrum of eigenmodes around the black hole. This new physics has a spectrum of eigenmodes around the black hole that can either be thought of as like you know, some discrete bound states or a continuum state. And this gravitational perturbation can mediate resonances, resonant transitions, either between discrete states or between the discrete state and the continuum. And that's kind of the, the general structure of the top. So what I want to do is, in a, a specific example, talk about the formation mechanism, how we can have uh, these ultralight fields spontaneously form you know, a very large macroscopic cloud with this sort of structure, and then how, what happens when the gravitational perturbation perturbs that system, that kind of laboratory experiment that's set up spontaneously in this discrete way and then in this continuous way. And what I'll argue is that there are very sharp and large signals coming from both of these that will dominantly affect the, the orbit of the companion and will show up in the gravitational wave signal that we would eventually see. So the specific example I want to talk about is a ultralight scalar field. This works for every type of boson. But what I'm going to focus on is this you know, mass of the field in the presence of a rotating black hole. So this is the Kerr metric. And specifically what I want to think about is what happens when this black hole of mass M or radius RG is in the presence of a field that has a very long Compton wave length. Okay. So there's a control parameter that I can re rely upon, which I'll call alpha which is called the gravitational fine structure constant, which is the ratio of the, gra the gravitational radius of the black hole to the Compton wavelength of the field. And in terms of the mass of the field mu and the mass of the black hole m, it's just given by mu times m. So. And the reason why it's called a fine structure constant is it becomes clear very, very soon. Um, so, in the presence of this black hole, the field is so large that it doesn't really see much of the geometry of the system. All it sees is the gravitational Coulomb force. So, kind of a one over R potential energy. And then, some effects from the fact that this black hole is spinning. And it sees subdominant effects due to that. Now, what is it, the velocity of the field? Um, so, so this, this is just for now, I'm just asking what kind of states or bound states in this field form around this black hole? Yeah, but the so formation then, is going to depend on the kinetic energy that turns at the beginning. Sorry? I mean, beside the fact of beside the energy level that you can compute, mm -hmm. of course, in the static uh, yeah. limit, but then the probability of formation will depend on the energy, kinetic energy of the scalar. So, so the the formation mechanism is not going to be some sort of capture or anything. It's going to be this thing called super radiance, where the black hole will spontaneously spin down and form a very particular state of the cloud. And that state of the cloud is very long lived. And so instead of thinking about you know, very spe you know, specific properties about 
what the field is. We can just think about the bound states and say that this formation process will take over and form a very specific bound state. Yeah, I'm just asking something mm -hmm. very simple that I don't understand. So how do I need to think this cloud of, of scalars? What is the average uh, velocity? Um, if you want, what is the De Broglie wavelength of this, you know, this guy? Yeah, so, so I, I think, I don't know exactly off the top of my head. That, that turns out not to matter for this, this story. Um, let, let me let me continue and maybe the okay. I, I think roughly it's the. No, I, I'm surprised just because this controls the kinetic term in the equation you wrote. Okay, that's what I. Mean. What what control this control? No, in the scalar equation there is a, a kinetic part. That yeah, depends on the degree wave. Yeah. Ah, uh, oh, uh, so the, the main yeah. So I, I think there is a competition between two different terms, yeah. the kinetic energy and the, the Coulomb potential mm -hmm. coming from, you know, just gravity, gravitational yeah. redshifting. And those are going to be on the same order. It's like asking, what, well, yeah, exactly. Let me, so assuming that this field is very light and taking a non-relativistic limit, Peeling off the rest mass oscillations of this field, this reduces to a third order equation sine of the Which looks like the hydrogen atom. So in terms of the De Broglie wavelength, you know, in some sense, like I don't know, I, I kind of know how to define that when it's a plane wave, but this is just some down state of the system. So we know we know what this the structure of this is to look like, at least in this limit, we can plot. The energies or the frequencies of these these modes, they're organized by Three quantum numbers, the principal quantum number, the orbital quantum number, and the as a neutral angular quantum number. And the spectrum looks like this. So at n equals one, I have an L equals zero state, n equals two, n equals three, and then these kind of become more and more dense until I reach the continuum of states in which the effective electron is unbound. Then L equals one, it starts out at N equals two, and there are three energy levels. These are broken by the fact that this, their degeneracy is broken by the fact that this black hole is spinning. And so the spin applies an effective magnetic field it gives me as energy splitting between these different states of, you know, different ends. So this is like two one one, two one zero, two one minus one, and then so on and so forth. This is another continuum, and then the same here. I have five now, and then I have this big continuum, and I have just this plethora of ways that this field can oscillate around this black hole. And I can rely on my intuition coming from, you know, underground quantum mechanics to understand how this, this field behaves in the presence of the black hole. So, and as you would expect, these energy levels, there's a rest mass contribution 
there's the bore splitting, there's the hyperfine splitting, and then the hyperfine splitting, which depends on this H holder quantity, which is something that controls how quickly the this black hole is spinning. So if H of is equal to one, then this is extreme. Okay. So we have in the presence of a black hole, you know, the gravitational potential acting on a massive scalar field has the ability of forming these hydrogenic like bound states and forming this gravitational atom. Now that's totally fine, but there's no reason a priori why this big one of these states would form. Okay. Are there any questions? So the, the picture that you should have is that there's a formation mechanism. Super radiance, which is a very general mechanism that applies to pretty much any object that is rotating and dissipative. You can actually derive it from the laws of thermodynamics. But the, the idea is that if I send a wave with frequency omega and angular momentum m, then it behaves. It rotates uh, around the black hole at an angular velocity given by omega over m. And if this angular velocity is less than the angular velocity of the horizon, then this wave can extract energy and angular momentum and its amplitude can become stronger as, after it scatters off the black hole. And then the idea is that if I place a big mirror around this black hole or a gravitational potential, anything that tries to confine this wave to this region, this process will happen over and over and over again until this mode extracts enough angular momentum and energy in order to satisfy the condition. Okay. So it's, it can spontaneously spin down the black hole and form a, a particular state with a particular angular azimuthal angular momentum and frequency. And what that does is it gives a small imaginary part to these modes. So instead of, instead of thinking about these as being purely real eigenvalues, I should think about there being a growth factor that's controlled by this small imaginary part to the frequencies. And this, at least for the scalar, is fairly highly suppressed. So it knows about the total angular momentum, sorry, the azimuthal angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum. And since this is very small, we know that the state which grows the fastest is going to be the one that has minimal or total orbital angular momentum and something that can make this positive. And that's going to be this 2 1 1 state, the 2p state of the hydrogen atom, which for favorable hole sizes can grow in about a thousand years. So that depends very sensitively on this alpha. 
I should have, I should have noted that this alpha is about 0 0.04 for a 60 solar mass black hole and a field that is 10 to the minus 13 meters of mass. So these are very light fields. They're fields with copper wavelengths that are much larger than the short field radius of, of astrophysical black holes. Yeah. Uh, can super regions be triggered around uh, stars and planets? Yes, it's not as efficient, I think. As the, so there's been some work that's looked at it uh, around neutron stars, where they can also spin down. Um, super radius is like kind of one of these fundamental physical phenomena that can happen in a variety of systems. It's just, it then becomes a question about whether it's efficient enough to actually, you know, grow such a large cloud in a, uh, not for, you know, in a short enough amount of time. How does the uh, efficiency scale with the, the mass? Ah, so, so it really depends on the, yeah, so this alpha is mu times m. And so there's some, you know, depending on if I'm holding mu fixed or holding m fixed, you know, it scales like alpha to the nine or alpha. Mu is a, what's it? Mu is the mass of the scale right here. is universal. Sorry? This result is universal. This, re this result here is only, <laughs> Depends on this. So, yeah. So, it, what, by universal, what do you mean? I mean that it holds for, for Newton star. For ah, Kerr no. Kerr. So, this is very specifically Kerr black holes with a free massive scalar field that happens. So, if I want to say anything that resembles the, ge the geometry, the geometry the yes, yes, that is not very sensitive to it. Sorry? You said before that it's not very sensitive to the geometry, no? Ah, the fact yeah. that the... that's, that's the tricky part, is this stuff is not sensitive to the geometry, but then, because this is so highly alpha-suppressed, really what, where that's coming from is from the very close regions of the black hole. And so it does know about the, the curved geometry, and, and that you can think of that growth rate as being due to the fact that this is actually a black hole with an ergo region and everything. Um, Sorry, how, how you compute that uh, the gamma? Uh, yeah. So there are a bunch of but that seems the difficult. Let's say the um, difficult part. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, maybe we can talk about it afterward. It, it's a it's a long arduous process. Um, can you just just yeah give yeah, an idea yeah how? exactly so I mean essentially what you want to do is you want to solve this equation subject to the constraint that this is its time dependence as a you know a definite frequency it's purely ingoing into the black hole and then it's purely outgoing sorry it's purely exponentially decaying so that it has like a finite extent and so that is a well defined you know, nonlinear eigenvalue problem. And so you have to solve that problem. You find the solutions which satisfy both boundary conditions. The tricky part is that um, in, uh, you can do it in alpha, in powers of alpha, but your perturbative expansion breaks down as you get closer and closer to the black hole. And so you have to, form a different perturbative expansion in that region that knows about the fact that you can't escape the black hole. And then you form a hydrogenic expansion out here, and then you have to match them. And once you do that, you find that you requiring that you have a purely ingoing boundary condition here gives you this purely, this small imaginary part, which is this view. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, as you said, I mean the scale the, 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 the thing that, the, 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 that is worrying is that it seems very UV sensitive, that part. Yeah, so so when you go to this. Yeah, yeah. So so I will say that this this part is the thing that 
does rely on kind of the near horizon properties of the black hole. Um, and when you start adding interactions and all of this stuff, they kind of just have no idea how it works. But I want to present this as like a one example of a, a general class. And maybe there are other ways that super radiance can generate this like system that is attached to a black hole. And this is a very particular example of it. Yeah. Yeah. So the efficiency of extraction of energy uh, grows with the mass of the particles, right? But then there's a trade off because if they are uh, too heavy, right? You cannot see anything. No? So, so the, the trade off is that this super radius process forms this like enormous cloud around the black hole. Its size, our cloud, throws us the gravitational radius of the black hole divided by alpha squared. So for very small alpha, in which I can confidently say that this is the answer, this is, you know, huge. And then it can have a density that's like 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 12 kilograms per meter cubed for, you know, quite large black holes, or has the density of water, like one kilogram per meter cube for you know solar mass black holes so it's this very like big fluffy thing which is rotating around the black hole at a frequency that's determined by this this energy and what that's going to do is it's going to emit gravitational radiation and cause the cloud to decay and so there's a time scale the lifetime of this particular state, which goes like some of the 10 years, I'm over 60 solar masses. And then this factor to the 15. That's a big power. So if I increase the mass too much and make alpha too big, it will grow very quickly, but it also just decay. And so what will happen there is that this black hole will very quickly spin down that state. Then there's another super radiant state here. It'll grow that, it will spin down very quickly. And so you'll just get this process where these black holes just spin down very efficiently and in some you know, quick run. Sorry? They become, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so the endpoint of all of these black holes is this a short field black hole. Yeah, that's how this gets around the no hair theorem. Um, but uh, the key for us is that for you know long periods of time, they can be the, the system that is a black hole with this like structure attached to it that can then be gravitationally perturbed. Thanks. Yeah. I'm sorry, can I ask a question? Uh, you maybe hinted at this in the in your previous comment. What happens if there are some self interaction? If the field has some self interactions, it's kind of uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, I think Luca and I talked about this for like an hour at lunch. I, I I don't know how to think about self interactions here. I assume that they. Yeah, I, I don't. Know. I I'd love to know. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, my my problem is I don't even know how to think about the down state when I have yeah. self interactions. <laughs> If anyone has any ideas, please. <laughs> um, okay. So there, there's one other very important property of this system that will end up giving you know very sharp signals. And it's a fact that I, I, I really didn't understand until um, we wrote this last paper is that the zero mode, sorry, so these are the bound states, but there are also a bunch of continuum states. So these I'll label with epsilon, the energy. These are not decay. And they also have an energy and then some radial function 
This depends on the energy. And some spherical harmonic. And if I have some awful form um, in the radial direction, here I'm going to plot mu alpha r. And here's five. And for you know some wavelength mode or some non-zero energy mode, it kind of looks like this. They look like vessel functions essentially, but very far away. In, in comparison, this two on one state looks like that. It's just some big hump whose uh, amplitude exponentially decays as they go off the part to infinity. And one of the key features of this system is that the Coulomb potential is long range. And that means that if I turn this energy to zero, the zero mode of this of these uh, unbound states is still localized around the black hole. So that's a very crucial feature that will show will have a very strong effect on the signal that you see when we start doing continual resonances. Okay. What this means is that if I have a gravitational perturbation and I look at the transition element between any bound state and that continuum state, the efficiency of ionizing essentially, this is finite. As that point goes to zero, we can basically see that from this picture that I drew. If I'm trying to go from the two and one state to this zero energy state, you know, I multiply by some radial profile and then I integrate, and it should give me a finite answer. If the Coulomb potential were not long range, this zero mode would just become totally unbound and I'd have a vanishing over. So, let me give, I probably spent a little too much time talking about the particular aspects of this cloud, but you should just know that there's some mechanism that allows us to attach a big, you know, complicated, rich structure to the black hole that will be gravitationally perturbed. And then the question is, well, there are a bunch of energy eigenstates or bound states and continuum states that the a binary companion can mediate transitions to. And so what happens to the cloud and to the end spiral at, that, at those points where the frequency matches the, the uh, so there are two cases. I have my cloud that's sitting in the two on one state. And I have the frequency of the perturbation ramping up like this. So there's going to be some point where the frequency matches the energy difference between those two states. And the case that I want to consider the 311 state. Because of the structure of the gravitational perturbation, this always has to change angular momentum. And so this transition always is accompanied by a change in the angular momentum. Here it's just my plus or minus two. About five minutes. Okay. Um, so let me give a, a very schematic picture. Let me just tell you what happens. So as I'm as the perturbation is scanning through these frequencies, what happens in this, the discrete case is that the perturbation causes a smooth and complete deoccupation from this state into this state. Okay. So if I'm tracking the spin of the cloud, what's going to happen is that 
it's going to drop like that. It's going to go from, you know, effectively plus one to minus one. All right. And the, the, the phenomena that, that governs this is the familiar one from atomic physics called adiabatic following. The gravitational perturbation changes the notion of the adiabatic ground state. And so as I'm moving through this transition, the system just smoothly and sharply goes from one state to the other. And that comes with the change of angular momentum. And so if I'm tracking the orbit, the total angular momentum of the orbit, that also has to change. It has to uh, uh, balance this change in angular momentum. And what I would get well, here, the angular momentum is D of the cloud is decreasing. This actually happens for counter rotating orbits. So the with reference to the cloud, the orbital angular momentum is negative. And this gives up angular momentum. And so at the same time, I see a sharp jump in the orbital angular momentum. If I'm tracking the frequency of the perturbation or the frequency of gravitational waves, as a function of time, it would be slowly increasing because of gravitational radiation. And then the system loses orbital angular momentum. So it very sharply sinks. The frequency jumps in kind of a big way until the resonance completes. And so if I'm you know paying attention to the frequency of gravitational radiation and measuring it using like Lisa. Then I see a relatively sharp signal in the, in the, in the, in the system. And if we compute the change in the number of orbital cycles that happens because of the cloud to go through the resonance, this is like for a certain range of parameters. Depends on the spin of the cloud. So for astrophysically, you know, this is roughly m squared one minus or alpha for this two one one state. So it's roughly a large fraction of the angular momentum of the black hole. I can see a very large, you know, 10 to the five cycles. There's a lot of cycles to get dephased by, especially if I'm sensitive to order one differences in cycles. We see this huge change in the evolution of the orbit. So I don't have enough time to talk so much about the continual resonances, because I'm quite afraid of Java. It is moderating hours. So let me just tell you what happens, there will be a point. Q the mass ratio. Yeah, Q is the mass ratio. Yeah. There will be a point in the orbit where the, the Pete Canyon is rotating fast enough to stir off the cloud and fling it from the black hole and ionize it. And if I track The relative occupancy of that bound state. I find that for quite a bit of work, this is approximately equal to the overlap between the, the strength of the interaction between that bound state and the continuum as a function of time where this energy is the frequency 
of the perturbation minus the, this energy there. So what I can think about happening is that the companion is stirring the system. It uh, keeps hitting the cloud. And then there's a frequency, epsilon b, at which this can re start resonantly ionizing the cloud. And then it starts to resonantly ionize into a particular state as a function of time. And because this was finite, as epsilon goes to zero, there's a finite transition amplitude going from here to the very edge of this continuum. I see that the instantaneous rate of the occupation, well, just be flat before the resonance, and then suddenly start to decay. And so there will be points in the orbit at which the power, the energy lost by the orbit due to this ionization effect will very sharply jump. Let me just draw picture. So if I plot the ratio between the power lost by the companion due to this ionization effect to the power loss due to gravitational waves as a function of radius, here is zero, here are 300, 200, 100. There will be a bunch of points that denote where resonance happens. And at these resonances, there will be a sharp jump. Okay, like this. Okay. And the scale here is like 200, 100. So what I see, if I'm paying attention to this the drift in the gravitational wave spectrum that I see, are going to be these very sharp features that are very, very prominent. And not only that, the presence of the cloud alone shrinks the time to merger by like half. If I, if I draw if I look at what happens to zero, the time to merger. And I start a system with the cloud and without the cloud at the same time at 400. What I'll see is that the system without the cloud will kind of the radius will behave like that. Maybe 400 years. Whereas the system with the cloud will merge in roughly half that time. So this system, which is very, very weakly coupled, because of these resonant phenomena, can drastically change the behavior of the inspar in a way that if we're trying to detect this sort of thing, we need to form specific template waveforms because the deviation from the GR expectation is so dramatic. So and the thing I wanted to point out is that very little of this really relied on the specific structure of the cloud. These sharp peaks rely on this, this fact that the wave function is localized around the black hole. The zero energy wave function is localized around the black hole. But these resonant effects are kind of this very general phenomenon. So if you can find a, a formation mechanism that sets up a system that sits around the black hole, then you can use this to detect that, that system. So if you have any ideas for a formation mechanism, let sure. me just let me know. Few quick questions for John. 
Yeah, so I guess so you were considering, I guess, the, the, the case of a binary system with uh, another object which is much smaller in mass, uh, right? This is what you were referring to these are? Or, uh, so, so the properties because, of the cloud uh, yeah, really the is whether you, if you had similar mass objects, similar objects, you would have two clouds, right? Uh, you would have you can have two clouds and then their resonances would overlap. Right. Yeah. Um, and so you'd see kind of a, a doubled set of of sharp signals that in the gravitational wave. So basically nothing happens and nothing is affected until it goes on resonance. And then you see the sharp signal. And one system will have a set of frequencies at which the resonance happens. The other system will have a set of frequencies in which that resonance happens. And then you know you scan through frequencies and you're mm -hmm. exciting them. So, so the actual structure of it becomes a lot more complicated yeah. because it depends on the history of right, right. which resonances are taken and stuff. Hi, thanks for the The imaginary part of the energy that you have to make is very suppressed compared to the real part. Basically, saying the, the, the super radiant instability is very weak. Yeah. So, would even a weak perturbation from, from the companion be enough to actually just turn off the so it's probably, I think, um, I haven't checked that. The, th the, the story I, I was talking about relies on just having the super radiant uh, instability growing the cloud and then taking that as some fully formed system. I don't think it's going to totally turn off super radiance. And I, I, I think some people have studied this, but I, I'm, I don't quite remember what they found. If it's a strong enough perturbation, then I, I could expect that it would turn off resonant or sorry, turn off super radiance for some clouds, and it could turn on super radiance for others. Just changing that super radiant condition. Yeah, I just wonder how, how big a perturbation would you apply to turn off the big grid But my my expectation is that really the the thing, the dangerous thing. Is it kind of you're close to super radiance turning off, and the perturbation to the frequency is enough to change this from this to this. But that's that's my gut feeling. Um, it's something I haven't understood. It's a really naive question. So you, you use a very very light scalar. I mean, are there fixed sparse constraints on scalars this light? So if if they only form due to the super radiant effect? I mean, you have a scalar field in ah, this. I mean, you know, it's everywhere. Ah, but, but not coupled to the standard model except gravitational. Right, but uh, I, if I remember correctly, the fixed sparse is stronger than gravitational. Yeah. That it has to be sub -planking. So Even a gravitational loop probably uh, would be... I don't remember exactly. No, when, the when you go loop, then you pay because very, very, very much because it's one over R. So you are thinking about exchange of the uh, scalar? Yeah. Of that scalar? It doesn't couple directly to the right? But the decay doesn't couple at all right. to, the, to, the, to the nuclei. So right. that's what. Yeah. So yeah, it's completely inert. You will not. Uh, but so so through gravity it's not going to be induced because it happens to gravity I mean, it, and then you put a gravitational okay and I, I don't know no it, it doesn't have an energy density like you said you can't really probe it you need okay. you need to have some abundance and he's assuming that you are producing it only around this okay. physical object that yeah. I guess is that yeah, yeah 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 I mean certainly if you assume more things about its abundance okay. there will definitely be more okay. Um, Maybe one, one answer to Trevor's question is if it's a pseudo scalar like the axion, then the big force will be some spin dependent. Okay, so then it's not it's so a little bit different if you show the equivalent principle. All right, any last question for John? Let's thank him again then.